Our scripture text this morning is the second chapter of Micah. Uh, The prophet Micah you can find at the end of the Old Testament in your Bibles or towards the end. Or on page 986 of the blue Bibles that are in the chair racks, you can turn directly there. Now, if you were here last week, uh, then you know that we are beginning a summer series in the book of Micah. And last week, I did a bit of an extended uh, introduction into the context of the book and who this guy was. In chapter 1, basically, a very quick summary, what we look at, we looked at was Micah uh, speaking about the people's rebellion against God. Now, in a more general kind of sense, their spiritual a prostitution, if you will. They're running after other gods rather than the one true God. And God speaking generally of the judgment uh, that would be coming if they failed to repent of their idolatry and their rebellion. Now in chapter 2, we get a little bit more specific. And so let me invite you, if you're able, to stand and listen as I read from Micah chapter 2. And when I'm done, I'm going to make the declaration that this is the word of the Lord and invite you to respond by saying thanks be to God. Micah chapter 2. Woe to those who devise wickedness and work evil on their beds. When the morning dawns, they perform it because it is in, their, in the power of their hand. They covet fields and seize them, and houses and take them away. They oppress a man and his house, a man and his inheritance. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, against this family I am devising disaster, from which you cannot remove your necks, and you shall not walk haughtily. For it will be a time of disaster. In that day they shall take up a taunt song against you and moan bitterly and say, We are utterly ruined. He changes the portion of my people. Now he removes it from me. To an apostate he allots our fields. Therefore you will have none to cast the line by lot in the assembly of the Lord. Do not preach, thus they preach. One should not preach of such things. Disgrace will not overtake us. Should this be said, O house of Jacob? Has the Lord grown impatient? Are these his deeds? Do not my words do good to him who walks uprightly? But lately my people have risen up as an enemy. You strip the rich robe from those who pass by trustingly with no thought of war. The women of my people you drive out from their delightful houses. From their young children you take away my splendor forever. Arise and go, for this is no place to rest, because of uncleanness that destroys with a grievous destruction." If a man should go about and utter wind and lies, saying, I will preach to you of wine and strong drink, he would be the preacher for this people. I will surely assemble all of you, O Jacob. I will gather the remnant of Israel. I will set them together like sheep in a fold, like a flock in its pasture, a noisy multitude of men. He who opens the breach goes up before them. They break through and pass the gate, going out by it. Their king passes on before them, the Lord at their head. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. Has someone ever taken advantage of you? Someone stronger and more powerful? Someone against whom you felt essentially powerless? When I was in in kindergarten, and this is relatively mild, I admit, but this is my memory of this. When I was in kindergarten, I was enlisted into the army of a bigger kid who went by the name of RJ. This is kindergarten. He was bigger than I was. He was stronger than I was. And I was in his army, I think, just because he wanted to be the commanding officer of someone else. And so I was drafted as his private so he could play sergeant. It was just like a power thing. Now, it didn't last particularly long. And frankly, like I said, it was pretty tame. I think he made me do push-ups once or something like that. Right? No big intervention was required. I don't think a school resource officer had to intervene. Right? And after a while, it just went away. But it is interesting. It gives us a picture of the power that bullies can have when they take advantage of people. Because after all, mild as it was, I remember very little about the specifics of kindergarten. And yet I still remember that, don't I? What about your experience? Ever been bullied? Right? Maybe you know what it's like to have another child bully you, and it's much worse than my little experience. You've been harassed, maybe you've been teased, maybe you've even been beat up. All right? Maybe it's not other kids. Maybe your, experience is, maybe your experience has been at the hands of an adult. At one time, maybe an adult that you thought you could trust, a husband, a, a parent who has abused you, maybe another relative. Right? Maybe even someone who had a position of authority over you, a police officer, a teacher, a pastor. 
Right? Here the violation is even more severe because it's not just a case of meanness like with a schoolyard bully. It's a violation of, of trust. Now, maybe, maybe instead you faced a bully in a more institutional kind of setting, the victim of an unjust business practice or uh, an unjust action of the, of the government or something like that. Well, in what we just read in Micah 2, we see God addressing a case of large-scale bullying, the strong taking advantage of the weak. And he has some pretty strong things to say about it. And I want to look at it under three headings. First, the bully. Second, the bar. And third, the breaker. Now, the bully might be, from what I already said, somewhat self-explanatory, but the bar and the breaker may require a little bit of explanation, and I intend to do that. But those are the three buckets into which we're going to put everything that we just read. The bully, the bar, and the breaker. Now, first, the bully. All right, let's walk through this text, because I want you to understand it. I don't want you to be afraid of, of Old Testament prophecy. I don't want you to be afraid of, of Hebrew poetry. Let's go through and look at some of the specifics of what Mike is doing here. Now, he's, in, Mike, in chapter 1, like I said, he spoke more abstractly about the sin of the people, but here he is getting more specific. Look again at verses 1 and 2. Woe to those who devise wickedness and work evil on their beds. All right, that's how he starts. All right, now, we, we begin to see here the scope of of the social problems that are in play here. Essentially, there are powerful people who are seizing the land and the homes and the personal property of other people. That's what's going on. And they're doing it, it seems, through, through dishonest, through underhanded practices, right? When it says oppress in verse 2, it means to, to defraud, right? Maybe it was dishonest lending practices. Maybe it was trick scales for money exchange. Maybe it was outright physical threats and extortion, but regardless, this idea of manipulative fraud is what the scholars say is also built into that that Hebrew word in verse 1 that's translated wickedness. That's what's going on. It's manipulative fraud and taking advantage of the people. One commentator says that the word means, that word wickedness, means to get rich by violence through the exercise of power against another person with deception and lying. The same commentator also points out that, ironically, these things are happening when? It says, when the morning dawns. Now, what's ironic about that is because the morning was symbolically the time for justice, not just in the Bible, but in other places in the ancient literature, you would see the king coming out in the morning to administer justice. That's when it happened. But instead, the irony here is, at the time when the people should have been able to expect justice to be done, they find corruption happening instead. Instead of power being used wisely on their behalf, power is being used manipulatively against them. And the evil use of power is exactly what we're talking about here, right? Why does it say they use their mornings to seize people's homes and property in verse 1? Why does it say? Because it is in their power. In other words, right, why are they doing it? Because they can. Because they've got the power. Then if you jump down to verses 8 and 9, you see even more elaboration of what was said in verse 2. Now, now, once again, you see the crimes involving the taking of property from the helpless, right? They make war against the helpless. They take their garments. They drive people from their homes. Now, interestingly, this tells us that the victims here are not necessarily all poor. After all, the targets of this injustice, some of them have possessions. They have rich robes. They have delightful houses. But, but while they have possessions, they obviously don't have the power. And this crime, the taking of land taking of homes, particularly cruel and devastating, because someone's land represented their, their, their livelihood. Now, it's, it's hard for us to think exactly in, terms, in these terms today. I mean, land is still important to us, and the taking of our home would be a very big deal, but, but particularly in suburban life, we don't have the same tie to the land as critical for our wealth and independence, right? Because we have bank accounts, we've got mutual funds, we've got other places where wealth is is stored. But in the ancient world, land is where your wealth was stored. And so if we don't understand that, we might miss the level of bullying that is going on here. And you don't have to think hard to get to some more modern analogies of the depth of the abuse that's happening here. In fact, I mean, I listed some of the types of them a few minutes ago. And if you think of some of those, right, particularly on some of the more extreme end of that, like the intentional mistreatment of a, of a child, if you think about that, and you get the sense of the image here in Micah 2, if you consider that sickening feeling that you get or that comes or that ought to come into your stomach when you hear about the mistreatment of a child, right, think about that, that disgust 
that, you, that, that, that you're meant to feel when, that, when you hear about that, that disgust is the same disgust that you're meant to feel when you hear about what's going on to the people here in Judah. It's a case of the bully taking advantage of the weak. Now, I don't want you to just simply kind of write it off, assume your own complete innocence in the matter because, oh, I don't hurt children. Right? No, we are, we are all part of the problem, and as sinners, we contribute to a world where those things happen, and we beat that drum a, a bit last week, but Micah's not denying the general sinfulness of humanity and what he's doing, but he is particularly grieved here in chapter 2 by this flagrant sin of the bully. All right, that's bucket number one, the bully. Now, bucket number two, the bar. Look at verses 3 and 4 which starts with therefore. In other words, in light of the injustice that God has just observed, this is what he plans to do, right? Just look at the start of verse 3. Therefore, thus says the Lord, behold, against this family I am devising disaster, right? Here we go, right? Justice is not found in the perceived superior goodness of the victim. That's not where justice is to be found. Justice is found in the courtroom of God. In a courtroom, right? The, the bar is the physical barrier that sort of separates the defendant from the, the judge, and the accused stands before the bar. And God here is calling the bully to stand at the bar, right? The bar of justice, so that he can pronounce the sentence, right? Stand at the bar and be sentenced. That's what God is saying, right? Justice is obviously not being practiced by the people's leaders. They are not arising in the morning to administer justice. And so God is saying, I will take the role of the avenging judge. Now, what's the sentence? Well, it's disaster. That's what it says. Humiliating exile where the people of, uh, of, of Israel and Judah are going to have their land taken from them. And God says it's, it's unavoidable. It's an event from which you cannot remove your necks. And it will be humiliating, he says. You shall not walk haughtily. And do you see the link between the sentence and the crime? Right? The bully plans iniquity. Remember verse 1. But in response, verse 3, God plans too. He's planning judgment. God answers their plans with his own plans, and God's plans will triumph. Right? Notice as well, the bully takes land from the weak, right? Remember verse 2? But in response, God will take land from the bully. Those who take property will themselves have their property taken from them. Now, that's significant in itself, but the ultimate justice of God, it goes beyond, more, it, it, it goes beyond just physical land. Look at verse 10. God tells them to arise and go, for this is no place to rest. No place to rest. To rest. Now, the Hebrew sense of what's being translated, a place to rest, carries a spiritual notion of well-being, a home, right? It's not just like kicking back on the, on the lounge chair, right? It's rest. It is total, complete rest. It is a home, not just the external political reality, but the whole sphere of salvation procured by God. But that resting place, he's saying, is being denied to the recipient of God's justice, Look back at verse 5. It says, Therefore you will have none to cast the line by lot in the assembly of the Lord. You will have none to go into the assembly of the Lord on your behalf and cast the line by lot to, to determine God's will, to be in between you and God. There will be no one who will do that. That's what he's saying. When Joshua led the ancient Israelites into Canaan, after they had been wandering in the desert for 40 years and before that, after they had been in slavery in Egypt, Joshua divided the land among the people, right? The land was a wonderful, it was a great blessing. It was intended to be a picture of the people's ultimate inheritance, the ultimate rest. The land was a picture of that. But God is saying that the bully at the bar of justice will have no portion in the final distribution of Israel's inheritance. In addition to losing what, what, what they had stolen They've lost their place in the great assembly of God when the inheritance is divided at the end of the age. When that final, ultimate rest is divided among God's people, they will have no place and they will have no one to go before them into the assembly of the Lord to intercede on their behalf. The one who is the bully will be excluded. And think about that. That's frightening. But this is the reality for those who persist in making themselves God's 
enemy. Now, there's a protest that's lodged here. Micah wasn't the only prophet on the scene. The bullies, they had their own prophets. They had found their own people to prophesy to them, and they respond in verse 6. That's what you see in verse 6. The other prophets responding, do not preach. Disgrace will not overtake you. In other words, they're calling Micah, and by implication God, they're calling him a liar. Nothing bad's going to happen to you. It's not going to happen. God would never do that. And in the first part of verse 7, they explain why they should think that. Should this be said, O house of Jacob, has the Lord grown impatient? Are these his deeds? Right? That's the summary of the false prophet's message, claiming that God would never do such a thing as bring God judgment on God's people. All right, that's what these guys were doing. They were just telling the people what they wanted to hear. God's not going to do that. Don't worry about it. You've got nothing to worry about. Micah even makes fun of the false prophets in verse 11, right? Did you see that? If a man should go out and utter wind and lies, saying, I will preach to you of wine and strong drink, he would be the preacher for this people. Now, interesting, the New International Version actually translates um, that the prophet will prophesy for you plenty of wine and plenty of beer. Isn't that funny? That's what Micah's saying. You know the kind of prophet you would like? You know the kind of prophet? The beer prophet, right? That's your kind of prophet. That's what he's saying. One who says to you, have more beer. Now we laugh, but we like that kind of prophet too, right? Wine and beer, they're just simply stand-ins that represent the affluence, the rest, the comfort that we think we're owed by God, right? We'll take the good life, but without all the demands that come along with it. We'll take the compassion, but without any of that anger. But I wonder... If we thought about it, is that really what we want? Is that really what the God that we want? Do we really want a God who never gets angry? Think about the implications of this. If you're confronted with real injustice, with real bullying, how do you feel when I even mention something like the mistreatment of a child? Do you really want a God who never gets angry at that? Whose character doesn't compel him to act? No, we want a God who does not leave the guilty unpunished. So the bar of justice is perfectly fair, and God's anger is justified yet because we know that his perfect standard, right, we did the confession of sin, we know that that, that bar, that standard is higher than any of us can meet, then we're rightly left searching for hope in all of this. And even in the midst of this chapter, even in the midst of all this talk of God's justice, there is a hint of that, there is a hint of that hope. Go back and look at verse 5, what we just read in verse 5 a minute ago. Therefore, you will have none to cast the line by lot in the assembly of the Lord, right? Judgment is signified. This is what we were just saying. It's signified for these people by having no one who will be their representative when the inheritance, the eternal inheritance is handed out. They will have no advocate for them in the assembly. That's what judgment will look like for them. But what does that imply? That there is an advocate. Right? That at least for some, there is an internal inheritance that someone will enter into the assembly of God on their behalf and divide up for them. In other words, there will be another Joshua who will divide the eternal inheritance. And Micah calls him the breaker. The bully, the bar, and now the breaker. One of Micah's core themes, right, we'll continue to see it as we study in the coming weeks, is that God will preserve and restore for himself a faithful remnant, a people. And in verses 12 to 13, we see the shift in prophecy from judgment to hope. And this, is, and this is welcome news because God here is addressing the remnant of those who are faithful to him. The ones who, unlike the bullies, recognize their need for God, who, who know his justice to be appropriate and yet are crying out for mercy. And, and this would include, presumably, all of the poor, all the, the homeless who have had their land taken from them by the bullies, presumably, right, if the kingdoms of, of Israel and Judah, if they eventually fall to foreign kings, as they both eventually would, then presumably they too would suffer along with the guilty. In their case, the land being taken from them twice, once by the bullies and then again by the conquering armies. But God here is telling them that the ultimate restoration will come. For all of Jacob, all 12 tribes, all the descendants of the promise made to Abraham, he tells them that there it will be a restoration, that the eternal inher inheritance will be given, and he tells them about the one who will do it. Now, he references this idea of a shepherd. Verse 12, God says he's going to gather his people to himself for protection. Right? That's not an image that is foreign to the Christian. Jesus himself claimed that title for himself. I am the good shepherd, he said, the one who knows his sheep, gathers his sheep into the pen, protects them from the wolf. 
Right? And John 11 tells us how Jesus does that, how he accomplishes that protection of his sheep, how he gathers the sheep to himself. How does he do it? Jesus said, the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. He says it like four or five times in about eight verses in John 11. And this is our hope, the only hope for those who, who respect God's justice and yet cry out for mercy. Now, incidentally, Today, for today, for where we are, this hope is still available to the bully. Maybe that's you. Maybe in this whole discussion, you're the abuser of authority. Don't forget that the Roman centurion, the symbol of abusive authority in Judah in that day, was the very first person to confess after the death of Jesus his faith in that Jesus. You can repent, and you can do it right now. You can come clean. You can experience forgiveness, and you can perhaps begin to repair the brokenness you've caused. Because the alternative to embracing God as your shepherd is to face Him as the breaker. In verse 12, we see God will gather His people, and then in verse 13, we see God will deliver them out of a besieged city. Look at this. Having gathered the remnant in, he now breaks the enemy's siege. He makes a breach in the enemy lines. He leads them out victoriously at their head, it says. Right? We learn at the end of the verse of a verse like this, like the shepherd, this is talking about the Lord himself. That's who this person is who will lead the people out, who will break the siege. He opens the breach, literally, that is the breaker. He who opens the breach He who breaks, right? Here's the image of what that means. In 2 Samuel chapter 5, God gives King David, remember King David, he gives him victory over the Philistines. And in verse 20 of 2 Samuel 5, David refers to the place where this happened. He calls that place, he calls it, Yahweh has broken through my enemies. Now he summarizes that with with, with one term or a compound term, Baal Perazim, right? Baal Perazim means the Lord of bursting out. Right? Like a mighty rush of water that levels everything in its path. That path, that's the image here of the breaker, breaking down, smashing whatever holds, whatever confines, whatever imprisons his people. And like the image of a shepherd, this too is intended to give us comfort, though in a very different way. One of the commentators says um, that the breaker is, is Micah's nickname for the Messiah. And it tells us that our rescuer is not just one who died, but one who didn't stay dead, right? Who burst forth from the grave, who broke out of the bindings that held him, who defeated the enemy of death, and he's going to lead his people in the same bursting out, and he's going to do it in front of them at their head. He's going to give them the same victory. Now, this is a different kind of comfort than the sacrificial shepherd, but this is real comfort. Dale Ralph Davis asks this question. He says, if you had to wend your way through the dangers of a large city at night, and you had a choice between two companions to go along with you, and all you knew about them were their names, Manfred or Rocky, who would you choose? Rocky, right? Right? Why? Because, I mean, I don't know Manfred. Maybe he's a really tough dude. But I'm just playing the odds that if things get ugly, ugly, I want to be with the guy whose nickname is The Rock. It's just me. In the same way, if I'm facing an enemy named Death, then I don't know about you, but I want to be let out by a guy whose nickname is The Breaker. There's an organization called Bikers Against Child Abuse, BACA. International, nonprofit, 39 states in the U.S., seven different countries. They work with children who have been the victims of physical, sexual, mental abuse. I once read the story of a girl named Rhythm. It's not her real name, but that's the name she went by, Rhythm. And the effects of the mistreatment that she had experienced, that she had suffered, made it impossible for her to live without fear in her life. So her parents, her counselor, they contacted Baca. And one day they showed up in her driveway, 25 of them. And when 25 bikers in full leather gear, bandanas tattooed, wind-weathered skin, when they roll into a quiet suburban cul-de-sac, the goal is to make an impression and send a message. And the message they want to send to anyone who might hurt that little girl is that they are prepared to be that child's shield. The mission statement that they have 
Baca's mission statement makes it clear that while they do not condone the use of of violence and physical force, they say, quote, if circumstances arise such such that we are the only obstacle preventing a child from further abuse, we stand ready to be that obstacle. All the bikers who show up, right, at Rhythm's house, they've all got They've all got names, road names, right? Names like Pipes and Rock and Nitro and Big Dog. All right, there's one guy who is six foot ten. They called him Tree. (laughs) Now, a child who has been abused by someone bigger and stronger knows what it feels like to be small and vulnerable. But when Tree and Big Dog escort you to school, Stand guard in the playground while you play. Spend the night camping on your front lawn. You begin to feel safe. One of these guys says, look, it's the biker image that makes this work. He says, no offense, but golfers against child abuse, it doesn't have the same feel. (laughs) The pink alligator shirt, the golf shoes standing in the driveway, it doesn't do the same thing. No offense to the golfers. In situations where a child is asked to testify against the abuser in court, Baca will often go with them as they testify. In one case, the judge looked at the little girl who was staring, uh, who was testifying against her abuser who was sitting in the very same room with her. And the judge asked her, are you, uh, are you afraid? And she answered, no. And the judge asked, why not? And she said, because my friends are scarier than his. See, here's the point. I don't know what your image of Jesus is, and I'm not necessarily saying he's all greasy and tattooed in a leather jacket. But I know this. When he's leading his people out of bondage and when he's defeating death, he's not wearing the pink alligator shirt. He's the breaker. And to anyone or anything that would threaten his children, he is very, very scary. That's what Micah wants us to see. God cares deeply about injustice. He stands against the bully, and he is ready to defend his sheep literally to the death. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for what you have done for us, that you are the judge who seeks justice, that you know our inability to meet the standard of your justice, and yet you have made provision provision for us through the work of one who comes to rescue and then to defend his people. And so, Lord, we pray that you would be at work in each of our hearts. Convict where sin is present. Bring comfort and assurance where it is needed. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.